Oh, we're reconnecting? Are we reconnecting? I think we're reconnecting. Okay. Yeah, so this machine that I was using as my workstation here also runs a VM in the background that is actually critical to streaming, so... Anyway, I think we're back after that crash. I don't know how much of that recording I lost, but we'll see. Do we have the network? Okay, I think we're back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, if you're just getting back, my Windows workstation here crashed, which is actually not the same machine that's running the stream, but it's running a virtual machine, which is important for the stream's health. So, yeah, that was actually maybe something that was nice about having a physical machine doing that job. Okay, well, what's next? Um, I mean, the warnings are no good. Wait, does that still float? I did forget. I don't think that would have caused any bugs, really, but not the cleanest. Anyway, I think I was just going to try to run this on a different input file. Um, maybe with profiling. So, let's switch back to the release build. And then when this crashed, I think I was just trying to find an input file. And then something without too much motion or too little motion. Is it unlucky to play these videos back full screen? Okay, so that has some nothing. And then I sprayed them with some water, and they hang out on the surface for a while. That seems like it won't be too boring. I'm watching some leaves dry out. Oh. Let's do that with debug. Oops. Did that last recording get corrupted because the machine crashed? I think this is one of the benefits of recording to MKV files. Is even if they just get truncated, they will still be usable, I think. Yeah, because it's truncated, it's not letting me seek, but I think it's fine. I'll just transcode it later. 
have a remux it at least. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder if the, the CUDA profiler was telling us a utilization percentage that does not account for the time spent decoding video. Because I do expect to be spending a lot of the time decoding video because, you know, if we're, if we're mostly skipping frames, then most of what we're doing is just decoding frames and throwing them into the accumulator buffer and then not doing much else with them. But like maybe that right there was a group of frames that we couldn't skip as quickly, and so we had to run optical flow. I've also been experimenting with running two of these at the same time just to increase utilization given the synchronization overhead. So there's a couple things I want. One is I would just like to run this a little while longer to see how the results look. Um, the other is I'd like to just keep optimizing it. So running this in the profiler. Maybe while this is running, I'll just see how my Git repo is looking. Because this, I haven't checked this in since we did the low resolution pyramids. Yeah, lower resolution optical flow is actually a good thing. We don't need the high res optical flow. Yeah, Tuco is pretty relaxed. Really like hanging out with him. In fact, I'm getting pretty hungry. It might be worth at some point soon taking a break from this and just letting it process for a while while I get some food. Um, you know, if I don't go super late, I might have time for a second stream. I can do some Siftio stuff maybe. I don't know, man. I, I, I like being able to share a lot of what I'm doing. I just also have been having a lot of trouble with the social anxiety lately in the streams. Um, maybe there's a way around that. This little, um, this little wooden channel switcher has still been working super well. It's the thing I did a while ago at this point. Not that long ago, but like I guess a couple months ago at this point. But yeah, I want to make a video about this because it was a fun project on its own, but also because there was kind of a fun little multiplexing technique I ended up using to make it work. Yeah, usually I have it sitting on the desk here. Um, it's attached to the keyboard, not quite solidly enough to like hold it up like this, but enough that if you move around the keyboard, it stays put, which was pretty much what I wanted. It's got a little bit of Velcro under there. So that's close to 60,000 input frames and almost not even 300 output frames. I um, wonder if that's enough to look at yet. I 
Oh, which file is this? This one? Oh, this looks right. Yeah. I mean, the, the parameters are slightly different. The motion is, I think, coming out a little bit faster. But, you know, that's like a tunable parameter. I'm not too fussed about keeping the values consistent yet because they're not really especially meaningful anyway. What I'm looking for is mostly just the same amount of motion from frame to frame as far as the human eye is concerned. And that looks close to what I've got. Quite sure what was going on with that isopod getting fast when they were walking around up here. Oh, because they were on that back edge of that leaf, and so there was a lot less surface area visible. I wonder if I should not be squaring the magnitudes. Which means bringing back that square root, but eh. I think one square root per pixel per frame is not going to kill me at this point. This looks alright though. And the, the debug images are making more sense now. So, I think the top one is the foreground mask, and the bottom one is the motion vector. Is that right? Yeah. if I want to let this keep running or if I want to adjust the way that the visualization here works. Because these images are really hard to see, they're so small. I don't think they need to be higher resolution for the calculation, but at least looking at them larger might help. Which I could do in post-processing, but I don't know, this is a debug feature, it's supposed to be quick and easy. So it's hard to tell if the normalization is working. Maybe the normalization is working too well and I actually just need to scale it by a constant amount. <clears throat> anything in OpenCV for doing multiple pyramid scales at once. <laughs> One way to answer that question would be to just search for calls to the pyramid scaler and see if anybody's like building a little looped version of that. I 
also just use resize, which is more generic and probably a lot less efficient than using pyramid scale. Because the, the nice thing about pyramid upscale and downscale, the reason it's called that, is that you are always scaling by two. So there isn't any like, complicated resampling math. It's just taking two bins and merging them into one, or taking one bin, merging them into two, and then smoothing it. Yeah, I'm just gonna use resize to keep the debug code simple. I didn't care about a bunch of those parameters, but I did actually want to give it a stream at the end. Oh yeah, I need to get a ring light set up going again. I had this ring light that I built for a previous iteration of the isopod box. Um, 
And I'm planning on bringing that back, but it's actually not in there right now. Um, I, I've actually just got this bare circuit board hanging in there for the camera. I need to make a new enclosure for it, and I need to have a ring light. Um, right now, all the lighting you're seeing, except for, I mean, there's a little bit of light on the microscope, but most of the light that you're seeing um, is actually outside the box, just like an Ikea gooseneck lamp just pointed near the lid. There's actually not very much light, but it just looks like a lot because the camera is set to pretty high gain. Alright, another debug run. Three stacked. Mask threshold is four pixels now. That's another thing, is I think I can change that divisor. That looks better. So foreground detector, motion vectors, non-masked motion vectors. So the actual mask that it's using is these two images roughly multiplied together. It's actually more like this image gated according to whether this pixel is zero or one. Or zero or non zero. Gosh, I can't believe my workstation crashed during a stream and took out the VM. I, I should I could run the VM on a different machine. The one that does streaming is usually a bit overloaded though. Um, and I had it running on the file server. Um, today that would have been fine because the file server is already making a bunch of noise, but usually the file server is idle and that helps with sound here. Yeah, the way the, the wet leaves slowly move is really satisfying to me. All right, let's run this in the profiler. So release build. I think I liked that file. Let's use the same file. Did I close that whole terminal? <laughs> ah, which file was that? Ah, whatever. Let's just run whatever was in here. Oh, Christian is wondering how solid these keyboards are. I, I don't know, not extremely. I'm not really that attached to the keyboard. This is just what I had and I'm slightly used to them, but 
I keep saying there's a bunch of different kinds of keyboards here. At one point, I got really used to the kind of Apple laptop style keyboards, but I've also spent tons of time on like a Model M and on ThinkPads. And, uh, my current situation is I've got a couple of these Apple style keyboards, but I've also got a Model 1, which is more of like a clicky mechanical keyboard. Oh, didn't I fix this? Oh, I don't want to run this in debug mode. I'm not that interested in how fast my debug compositing is. Alright, debug 0, threshold 0 0.01, mask threshold is 10 pixels. So what this means is that it will throw out frames, or rather average them together, until it reaches a certain amount of total motion over all foreground pixels. The units for that are pretty arbitrary, but this threshold is that total. Um, mask threshold is based on that threshold, but it's used for an early out, so that if at least, or if not, if it, no more than if fewer than 10 pixels are actually in the final foreground mask, then it will go ahead and skip processing the uh, optical flow to save time. So you can see it's been skipping the optical flow on 400 out of 3,000 of the frames. Oh, that's probably enough. That's the one we just made. Yeah, it looks like it was pretty good at ignoring the lighting changes over here and just looking at this motion. One of the videos I ran this on when I was working on a much earlier version of this before adding the optical flow, it was just looking at differences in pixel values and lighting changes like that just totally messed it up. It was mostly just finding the times when the lighting flickered rather than looking at the bugs. It does look more consistently busy. We're pretty zoomed out though. So yeah, it looks like we're basically not bottlenecked on the API anymore. So we're waiting on the device to finish up here. Gosh, this code seems like it could run about twice as fast if we were pipelining frames. Hmm. That might be the next major change. What I mean by that is like, read, like not have to stop the world here, but get one frame ready, get the next frame ready, get the next frame ready, do all that back to back. And then after getting this frame ready, we can then start to use the motion results from whatever was previous. A 
which means really dividing this into two separate flows, like one flow that is looking at... I was going to say dividing this into two separate flows, where one is um, one is dealing with the motion detection and one is dealing with the accumulation. I don't think it's quite that straightforward, though. Um, the decision that we're making about whether to keep the frame or... So, like, the decision we're making at each frame is do we add this to the accumulator or do we reset the accumulator? Relatedly, though, we're also making a decision about whether to save a new reference image uh, for the optical flow. So, for example, the motion threshold decision on frame, like n, would affect potentially the reference image used by frame n plus 1. That's a problem for performance. We could save the optical flow, though, and just do the foreground background detector first, though. Like, just imagine taking this, sticking it right there instead, and then just closing this gap. I think that would work. Because this stall, we could just be running the foreground detector during that time for the next frame. This is some of the reason why I don't want to clean this code up too much yet, because there are still revelations like this that might completely change how I have to structure things, which I kind of want to know early on. So this is like why performance prototyping is pretty useful. There's also that little delay between... what is that? Yeah, that's a little synchronized. Is that for the early out? It's not too bad, though. This is our device utilization, right? 100% utilization during this portion of time, and then it's just idle. That's what we want to avoid with paying attention to device synchronization like this. We want to keep these queues as full as we can keep them. There's two streams, too. Where'd the other stream come from? That is not mine. I think that's the video decoder. Is it? Maybe video encoder? Is that on a different stream? I think that's the download at the end of the frame. It should be on the same stream unless I'm messing something up. I wonder if there's a way to separate this into multiple concurrent processes that communicate with each other. So I can imagine a pipeline where you have one process that's just reading frames, you have another process that's just running the background detector, 
And if those each had a buffer of a couple of frames, then we could do a great job at keeping the GPU busy. Like we could do this with one host thread, like in the C++ application, or with multiple host threads, I think. I'd have to go figure out how both CUDA itself and the OpenCV wrapper handle multi-threading, if at all. I think the way this works is that the CUDA data structures, like they don't have any internal mutexes or anything, so you can only use them on one thread without external mutexing or whatever. But, I th there's got to be a way to pass resources, like GPU resources, between threads. I don't know how restricted that is. So, like, one possibility is that as long as on the C++ side you make sure that resources are accessed in a mutually exclusive way, that you can pass them between threads. There might also be reasons why you can only access a single stream on a single thread. I'd have to go look to see if there are restrictions like that. But one way to do this would be to have just a single host thread where, um, like, you can imagine having, like, a class that is a, like, a source of um, segmented frames. And you can ask it, like, give me a segmented frame. And it'll give you a segmented frame just as, like, a blocking API. But then under that, you can imagine maybe it, and this maybe depends on whether we have non-blocking events, but it could look and see how much progress the GPU has made and issue additional commands if it needs to in order to keep uh, like a queue full of frames that are ready to, ready to take out. So like at this point, we have no decisions going into there. It's just input frames. But it's also a lot of GPU work that we could be doing ahead of time. Another simpler way I could imagine, well, maybe simpler. These things all have different kinds of complexity. Um, another way I could imagine doing this, though, is to... Well, that gets really messy really quickly. I was going to say something. I was imagining something that was basically just a copy of this operation, but down here, so we can... We can just sort of pre-prepare that buffer and then have a flag indicate that there's already data there. That gets really unwieldy though, and it only handles a single frame of buffering. This might be time to start separating this into multiple classes so that we can implement complicated mechanisms like that without it becoming unwieldy. Debating whether to keep doing that on this stream or whether to end the stream though. I think we got some more time. Hmm. I'm just trying to plan out where this is going a little bit before just starting to write code. Um, I'm still not sure how we keep track of flow control without a non-blocking event. So do we have non-blocking events? Oh, 
have inter-process events. That's cool. I feel like things are getting real enough that maybe I should just spend an evening reading CUDA documentation. But yeah, we have query of complete, which is exactly what I want. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, GPU performance counters. These are nice. Um, so we could have a queue of frames that each have. Well, so what can we really do here? Can we do... <sighs> what stream does this use? This doesn't use... We can't specify a stream here, can we? I'm kind of curious what our profile looks like if all we do is call input next frame. Just because I'm not really sure how the CUDA video decoder works. See what that looks like. So these should be the individual frames. Stream query. The, this does look like that other stream we were seeing with the conversions here. I assume that the video is just happening during one of these gaps and we just don't see it on this trace. I think what I'm noticing here is that I don't think the APIs actually give us strong enough asynchrony around the video decoding to do this on one host thread. So I think I need multiple threads. I think I need to be able to pass CUDA buffers between the threads. So I need to know what the constraints are around that. Yeah, yeah, I know I can use streams. We're talking about API concurrency limitations here. Come 
contexts. How many contexts do we have? And is this even still part of the current API? Because that seemed like a pretty old version. That's a really old version. I would expect this to just be in the API documentation. Oh, cool. Runtime API handles contexts. This would seem to indicate that contexts are thread safe, but Quite ready to assume that. Let's find the dog specifically for streams. Mm. Maybe a higher level docs for streams. Thread management deprecated. I'm assuming this is automatic now. I don't know. This also looks old. Yeah, this is from nine years ago. CUDA 10.
I can't tell if this is old. I think this is old, but my current research question is, in the current version of CUDA, how do you share resources on the same device between multiple host threads? I should be running, I should be running this code in the background while I'm doing research. Slightly conflicted about running the debug version, but sure. Ugh, no. Not talking about device threads. Specifically host threads. I don't suppose Google is any better at this. <laughs> Intro to making things fast. This is a decent intro to making things fast, actually. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of different levels of optimization to pursue here. Um, the thing that I'm specifically looking at right now is how to keep the GPU from being idle. Because when we're, like, this is a long running operation. I'm processing this huge video file, but there are steps where we have to go back and forth between the CPU and the GPU to get through that. So when, when that runs and we see the timeline, there are all these idle periods where, at least according to this view that we're seeing through the CUDA API, the GPU is idle, then we do some stuff on the CPU, then the GPU works again. And, you know, some of that might be stuff that's, you know, time that's taken up by operations that are just not on this profile. Like, I think we might be missing some of the video operations, but I think a lot of it actually is this back and forth that we can avoid. So specifically, there are some synchronization points where I think we can be doing operations to prepare for the next frame before we actually know what the motion value is for the current frame. That's what I'm trying to work toward. Um, I just think the approach I'm going to need to do to actually get there involves using multiple host threads because of limitations in these APIs. So maybe there are different APIs to use. Maybe I just ditch OpenCV and use native CUDA. I don't know. There's a lot of different approaches here. I'm just looking around to try to find something that is not super unreasonable. Right? Concurrency. That's pretty cool. Device and host pointers use the same address space optionally. It certainly is compelling to switch to doing this directly in CUDA. I think I might enjoy that API better since it seems to be a bit more thought out than the OpenCV wrappers.
Oh, hey, Tuco. Tuco came over here to say hi. This is some good advice. I mean, one way to do this would certainly just be just have a giant CUDA kernel that just tries to do all this work at once. I'm just trying not to generate a whole bunch of special purpose code for this. I'd like to keep simple things simple. Talk about host threads. I'm a little bit annoyed that they use the same word to talk about GPU threads and host threads. I think I just need to find a document specifically about resource sharing. Well, the other question is, so I, I don't know, I'd like to find some actually good documentation about the specific host multi-threading features of CUDA. Um, reading between the lines on the documentation I have seen, it seems like what's going on is contexts, which are like the pipe that the user space app uses to communicate with the driver, those seem to be automatically managed by the runtime library, so whatever. Um, it seems like uh, it seems like streams. I can't really tell whether they're shareable between threads, but I would assume that you can't share a stream with another thread, or at least you wouldn't get meaningful results if you did. But what I would like to do is share resources. So in this case, they'd be those GPU mat buffers. So if you know, like, I, I'm assuming I'm still on the hook to keep track of, like, resource lifetimes and, like, API mutual exclusion, all that kind of, th kind of stuff. But if I make sure that at least at the API level, those resources are not accessed uh, concurrently, can I still use them concurrently on the GPU? Or at least can I pass them between GPU threads? 
Because, yeah, I'm not actually interested in concurrently using the same like GPU mat on multiple streams. Like, I don't actually want to do that. I just want to hand them off between streams. I, I feel like this must work, though. Like, the address thing is unified. I don't know why it wouldn't work, especially if I'm doing the mutual exclusion. So I might just assume that that works and think about the next step, which is what kind of multi-threading API do I use? Like, I would actually really like something like Rust Channels. Um, oh, what have I done? It's like that. C++11 doesn't have a channel object, does it? There's probably something in Boost for this. I don't know if I want to use Boost, but maybe it's fine. <sighs> Not St. Louis, C++. thing I'm actually trying to do here with host threads is that I don't want this function to be able to issue a GPU synchronization which then blocks unrelated code not part of the video decode. So I want separate host threads for the video decode plus foreground background I guess. Um, although those I guess could be multiple threads. And then definitely a separate thread for um, for everything that happens after that. So the motion vectors the motion decision. And then I could also do, like if I'm adding threads, I could also break the output into a separate thread, which I've been wanting to do. <laughs> I don't know, Tuco seems pretty quiet to me. We still not have any output frames for this video. Hmm. check in this video to see if it's actually correct that there's no motion at the beginning. Oh yeah. I think the camera is actually frozen. Like I'm, I don't see the usual amount of noise here. Maybe things are just really slow. There's definitely some leaves moving around once we get to like two hours into this video.
I certainly want to see how it looks when they eat on this uh, motion sensitive time lapse. And there's a little one. A little buggo. It's cute when they're this age and they're mostly transparent, but you can see this little like little streak down the middle. Like I assume I assume that's their innards, their little digestive system. But maybe it's also part of the beginning of the shell coloration. They're really cute. Oh wow, that's pretty cool, just watching the food shrink. How much of that is them eating it and how much of it is losing water mass, I wonder. Whoa, there were just a bunch of little ones on it right here. Are they sleeping on the food? <laughs> I think they're eating. I think they're just kind of like perched on top of each other as they're eating. <laughs> I think we lost a lot of people when the stream died and they didn't come back. <laughs> well, this should be an interesting video to see the time lapse of. Um, so where are we at with the performance? I feel like we've, we've done at least some of the easy optimizations. Uh, I think we could still make it run about twice as fast if we multi-thread the host code though. Because I think the GPU is still, you know, Still got a little, a little bit of idle time on each frame that we could be using. Hmm. I wonder what it's going to be like with the eating motion. Because I feel like there will be, like, I don't know about oscillating motion, right? Because like when, when you have a bug that's moving across the frame, you could skip some frames and then the total amount of motion will increase. But if it's oscillating, you skip some frames and the motion doesn't increase. So if you have an oscillating motion that's under the threshold, then you could end up just skipping it entirely. So I don't know how much we're going to see the little head wiggles. I hope we see them because they're cute. That's probably enough motion, mostly because it's so big. You know, I guess that's part of the difference in the motion vectors we're getting. I was taking into account the number of pixels, but not the size of the pixels relative to the frame. I feel like we should multiply the motion amount by the square of the downsampling factor. That might get us back to where I'm expecting it to be. Yeah, we should do that. I'm gonna bring this back up to 0.05.
All right. I, I'm not totally sure, but I think that'll bring the threshold more in line with how it was before. I'm just realizing that, yeah, I was, I was adjusting it according to the, s the number of pixels for the average, but I forgot about how scaling the image also scales the vectors. Post multi threading to use here. <laughs> this would almost be a good excuse to rewrite this in Rust, although I don't know if that would just make my whole like build environment a lot more annoying. But I assume whatever Rust wrappers exist for OpenCV don't have whatever bleeding edge OpenCV stuff I'm using. idea how much this supports. Okay. I'm using OpenCV4. Oh wow, this has support for CUDA. That's out of date. There's another one? Why are there so many Rust libraries for OpenCV? I mean, I think I know the answer to that because like a lot of people probably need this, but don't wanna, or, like don't like have the time to make like a really solid binding for everything. Hmm. Well, this is going to take a while. Um, obviously. <laughs> This might be a good time to wrap up the stream, and I can think about how to do the multi-threading on this, and think about other improvements to make, but it's already way faster than it was when we started, so that should be nice. And what is, what do we think the GPU utilization is right now? Oh, also I should probably turn out the fans on the GPU. It is a little warm, but not, you know, not problem warmness. It's also only using 110 watts right now. So, yeah, so this is much more power efficient than it was because it's running faster and using less GPU power. But it also means that if we can get it to run using the, more of the GPU, then it should be able to run significantly even faster than it currently is. Hmm. Oh, Tuco. And like OpenCV, they don't have any preferred op like C++ threading library, do they? I 
feel like the thing I want is probably part of boost. But like, maybe there's a library that just does this. That might be nice. Why is there namespace CPP? <laughs> this is like naming, giving your kid a last name of human. Is it just so the whole thing reads a CPP channel so they could have their library name make sense? It's kind of silly. I think one thing that I like about Boost is that they have a pretty good process for making their code stable and well documented. One thing I don't like about Boost is that it's often enormous and hard to install and gives you just ridiculous template situations that you find yourself in. But some of the Boost libraries are not like that and some of them are really, really like that. <sighs> this be in data structures or concurrency? I have written so many ring buffers, I'd rather not write another one. But I mean, I could write a ring buffer. That's another option is like, we could just write a ring buffer. But I like to avoid reinventing all the wheels. into that. Okay.
Mm. All right, yeah, maybe we can tolerate a boost dependency. This program is already not especially easy to compile, so I don't feel that compelled to optimize for dependencies right now. some attention to. Well, maybe it is time to end the stream and I can come back a little fresher and do more of this or more of something else. <laughs> We've got plenty of the something else. <laughs> All right, yeah, I think I'm gonna hang out with Tuco for a bit and get something to eat. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for joining me. I hope some of that was interesting. Um, I know it was like a little different than what I usually do, a little different than what I was planning on, but this was what I was working on anyway. And in my current kind of high social anxiety state, it was a little nicer to stream this than some of the other stuff. Um, but yeah, that was some basic computer vision to identify uh, isopods, sort of. Not really identify them, but look for motion and try to time-lapse video in a way which preserves the overall rate of motion. So in case you missed some of the outputs, uh, I've got a little bit of that on diode zone. You can see a bit of what we're trying to do. This is the sample output, and these are some of the internal views of the foreground pixels and the motion vectors. So yeah, the idea is that you can still pretty clearly see the little buggos wandering around and see what they're doing, but you avoid all the nothingness that often accompanies this footage. So I like it so far. I'm just trying to make it more efficient so I can run like several terabytes of footage through this thing without it taking forever. All right. Thanks for hanging out. Um, and a special thanks to everyone who keeps this going by uh, supporting the channel on Patreon, by sending in hardware, by telling your friends about the stream. That's what makes this go. So if you like it, um, keep on uh, keep on being awesome and you know doing the things that you do. But also, uh, you know, if you want something that you're not getting on the stream, if you have a suggestion, then I'm into the hearing that. So you can poke me on any of the social media platforms. You can even email me as much as I hate email, but I, I do read them as much as I, uh, I have trouble with the social interaction. I do, uh, I do try and I'll, I'll definitely read the email you send me. Um, and yeah, I, I appreciate the, uh, you know, all the help and the trust in making this go. So I'll keep trying to do my part and uh, I will see you next time. And as usual, if you follow me on Twitter or you hang out on the Gitter chat between streams, I try to keep folks updated about what I'm working on. Um, a lot of lately has been just like shop IT work and like fussing with computers, but I've also been um, working on like recording some of this Siftio stuff that we got in the mail. I've got this big art orb thing that I'm actually disassembling, but trying to get some good video of on the way out. I've got a bunch of other stuff I'm just organizing. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of ongoing projects and I'm always interested in hearing about what you want to focus on more than other things. So anyway, happy hacking folks. Thanks again, and I'll see you all next time. <laughs>